Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've done in our lives and what you are doing in us and what you will do through us. And over these next few moments, I ask that you'll send your Holy Spirit to, to push us further than we've been pushed before. Make us grow. Help us to be deeper disciples today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're a parent, you've done this before. There's, no, there's nothing to be ashamed of either. In fact, that's why I'm able to admit this. But occasionally, in my household, when we have something really good, you know the good stuff, like Krispy Kreme donuts. Can I get a witness, somebody? Mm -hmm. My son just raised his hand. That's cute. Um, or like Oreos. Or peanut butter M&Ms. Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. A few of you. That's good. All ages. That's good. When we have the good stuff in the pantry, sometimes I will walk over to the pantry. We have a very small pantry. I open the door. I step inside the pantry to make sure I don't step on the tortilla chips that are there. I close the pantry door so that I can enjoy the good stuff all by myself. Am I the only one that's done this? No. And if you have, if you're not raising your hand or nodding or in your heart you're saying yes, then you're lying. We've all done this. Especially if you're a parent of little kids, because so often you know what'll happen. If you eat that out there in public, oh, the kids are gonna want some. Some of you, you're not even hiding from your kids, you're hiding from your spouse. You just want the good stuff because it's so good. And, and let's be honest, nobody wants to share the good stuff. I mean, it's the best. You only get it once in a while, and it's so good. In fact, uh, this, this part of our lives is, is just, it's natural. You're born with this in you. In fact, it's called selfishness, and we all have it, where we don't want to share the good things that we have. This morning, um, we're going to look at just a couple of verses, but they've challenged me this week, and I'm praying that God pushes you to, pushes us more and more to be others-centered and to be you first, me second kind of disciples. And so um, here's the deal. We're going to look at a few verses, and then we're going to look at application. So just be with me in the word, in the verses, and then we'll go to application. Can we do that this morning? Oh, can we do that this morning? Yes. Okay, good. I'm glad you're still there. All right. If you have your Bibles, you can open them to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. If you are new to church, maybe you've never even been to a church, there is a blue book in front of you. It's the Bible, and you can turn to page 451, and you can read right along with me as we read in Proverbs chapter 3. Now, I love the book of Proverbs. King Solomon, he was this king back in the Old Testament. He asks for wisdom, and God gives him wisdom, and he passes it on to us. So this is heavenly wisdom given to a human that's passed on to you and me today. And we get to read it and apply it to our lives. It's just the coolest thing. The book of Proverbs blows my mind. And if we just applied what Solomon said in our life, in our lives, I think we would be better human beings. In fact, he starts off Proverbs in the first few chapters with the good stuff that we read today. Proverbs chapter 3, page 451 in the Pew Bible, if you're looking it up there. Here's, what it's, here's the few verses that are before we get into the meat. Here's what Solomon says, verse one. He says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. He says, listen to what I'm gonna say and put it in your heart and you'll have a rich and healthy and fulfilled life. Verses three and four, he says this. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. He says, let your love shine forth. Be faithful. And as you do this, you'll have a rich and healthy and beautiful, fulfilled life. Are you seeing the trend? He says, follow my words and you have a wonderful life. He gets into the next two verses, which you know well, and I don't even have to read them. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Proverbs says, uh, Solomon says, Trust God. Lean on him. He'll direct your paths, and you'll live a rich and healthy and fulfilled life. It's the trend. It's what he's saying. And when he gets down to verse 27, he pushes me very far. And I'm okay with that. I like to be challenged sometimes. Here's what Solomon says, especially in regards to generosity. Verse 27, he says this. 
Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it's in your power to act. I'm going to read that again. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, eh, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you when you already have it with you. Solomon says the good stuff, he says, give it away. The good stuff, share it with somebody else. Don't make them come back. Don't make them beg for it. If you've got the good stuff, you give it to somebody else. He goes on, the next verse, which ah, it's hard for me to make the connection here. Here's what he says, verse 29. He says, do not plot harm against your neighbor who lives trustfully near you. Uh, it's kind of weird because he, 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 at first time he's saying, hey, get the good stuff and share it with others. But now he's talking about harming your neighbor. I don't see the correlation. At least as I've thought about it a little bit this week, I think this is what he's saying. I think Solomon is trying to say, if you don't give the good stuff, you're actually hurting your neighbor. You're harming your neighbor. Let me give you an illustration via Google Maps Street View perspective. You know Street View? Do you ever use that? A couple of you? Uh, some of you use Waze, that's cool. Or maybe Apple Maps, that's a mistake. <laughs> Google Maps, sometimes you wanna know where you're gonna go, so you put in the address and, and you see the directions, but if you click on Street View, it will give you a live, or not a live, it'll give you a view of what the building looks like. In fact, I, mi I made a major mistake this week because there's a picture that needed to be in here. Back when uh, we were living in Buford, Georgia, the northeast part of Atlanta, uh, I was leaving, heading somewhere, and as I was driving out of our subdivision, the Google Maps car drove in. Have you seen those before? It's the car that has this, this big camera that's way up on top. And as it drove in our neighborhood, I called Jen. And I said, hey, go outside with Caffrey. And, as, and if, if you went on, and I, I made a ma mistake. I should have had the picture here. Maybe I'll send you my old address and you guys can look it up. If you look at our old address, you see my wife and son waving at the camera as it goes by. <laughs> so Google Maps Street View. When I lived in Marietta, I lived in this house here. Here's a picture of it. Yeah. It, this, is tw this is 2013. It's a little cheaper to live in Atlanta if you guys are like, ooh, that pastor's making a lot of money. No, relax. <laughs> it, the house looks so much different now. It's painted, it's fixed up. The fo Look how big those bushes are to the left of the house. I mean, they're, th th those are like 25 foot tall bushes. They're huge. They're gone now. Well, I hope they're gone now. I cut them down a long time ago. The, the yard looked nice. There's a fence now. We put a lot of time and effort into this house. Right across the street from our house is this house. Ah, this house belongs to Ed Luand. He was the HOA, the, the Homeowners Association president. Great guy, not very spiritual, yet um, he had a high respect for pastors. And so we became friends. In fact, what's cool is that over the five years that I lived in this house, Ed started coming to my church he even went into a discipleship course and, and spent many weeks learning about Jesus. It was just really rich. Up the hill from this house is the next house. There it is. This is Chris Austin's house. Great guy. He's an airplane mechanic that works down there at Atlanta Hartsfield Jackson Airport. He works nights. The guy has every tool you could ever imagine. And we're talking the good tools. We're not talking, you know, knockoff brands. These are snap-on tools. Like, they're the good stuff right? I mean, none of it breaks. It's just good stuff. Now, I lived on a corner, and across the street on the other side was this house. There it is. Now, Justin and Brandy Courget lived there. They moved in about six months after us. They had two kids, a little boy, a little girl, neat family. Now, here's what's neat. Of all these houses and all these neighbors of mine, they all, all the guys liked to work with their hands. So we'd work on our houses, we'd work on our cars, and the beautiful thing is all of us had some tools and we would share our tools. It was great. Like Chris sometimes would come over and he'd say, hey Matt, can I borrow your table saw or your extension ladder? And I would say, absolutely, if I can borrow your pressure washer. <laughs> One time he wanted to borrow my, my chipper, my wood chipper, but I got that chipper from Ed, the HOA president, because uh, it didn't work. And he said, well, I'm gonna throw it out. And I said, well, give it to me and I fixed it. And so it just it traveled the neighborhood. The wood chipper kept going to other people's houses. Uh, in, the, in the blazing hot summer of Atlanta, and it gets hot there, let me tell you. Uh, my grass was like knee high because it was Bermuda grass, not the St. Augustine grass we have here, but this spreading, growing kind. It's, it's, oh, it's terrible. It's nice, but it's terrible. It was so hot, blazing hot, and my lawnmower broke. 
So I went across the street to Chris's house. I said, hey man, can I borrow your, uh, your lawnmower? He said, sure, go right ahead. And so I, I used his mower to mow my yard. The next week, my mower still wasn't fixed. I went across the street to Justin's house and I said, hey man, can I borrow your mower? And he said, yes, and it was a riding mower, which changed my life forever. <laughs> We just had this good thing going where we could just share the good stuff with each other. If you needed a tool, you just called somebody and went and got it. In fact, Chris, my neighbor straight, the the airplane mechanic, I could just text him, hey man, I need a half inch breaker bar. I think you probably got one. You care if I go get it? I could walk across the street, whether he responded or not, he trusted me. I could walk right into his garage, right to his tool chest, open up the half inch drive stuff, find the breaker bar and take it. And he would be totally fine because we had this trust in this relationship. We just shared our tools all over the place. It's good. We had the good stuff. But what would happen if one of those guys came over to my house and said, hey, Matt, uh, can I borrow that, that, uh, that ladder of yours? And I said, no. Am I harming them? Well, probably not. But it sure hurts our relationship, doesn't it? It went from a place where we trusted each other and believed that we had the best interest for each other in mind to now it's a place of questioning, like why wouldn't he do that? And does he not like me anymore? And see, guys have this drama too, ladies, just so you know. (laughs) I think you could sum it up in this way right here. Let's put it on the screen. When we withhold the good stuff from others, our actions are more harm-filled than good. Solomon says, live a good life and share the good stuff and you'll have a wonderful life forever. Live a generous you first, me second kind of life and your life will be the best it can be. And when you don't, you're harming somebody. Solomon goes the next step though in verse 30 and it really pushes me here. He says this, do not accuse anyone for no reason when they have done no harm. When I read this fourth verse, this, this fourth verse in these, uh, this little passage here, I feel like Solomon is in my head. Or like the Holy Spirit knows me so well that he's pinpointing this to me. Don't accuse someone if they've never done something to you. Because I'll tell you what, church, when we have the good stuff and we don't want to give it away, what we do so often is we make excuses. And we'll find some reason why we don't have to give it away. We will rationalize, we'll come up with reasons, we'll fabricate ideas in our minds so that we don't have to give the good stuff away. Let me give you an example. I have one more neighbor. Here's a picture of his house. That house to the left was my house. You can't even see this guy's house. It's the the red door. You you probably can't see it from there on the small screen here. Dead center is this red door. That's the house. I don't even know his name. But I'll tell you about him. He lived just across the fence from me. I know that he had a $100,000 swimming pool that he put in his backyard. Oh, and the sounds of the splashing and the kids playing in the hot summer. It sounded so good, but I never got an invite. I know about the guy because I uh, would wave to him as he would drive by on his Harley Davidson or his sweet Ford F-250 Platinum Edition. And I would wave to him and he would just stare at me. No waving, not even a head nod. Nothing. And so as I've experienced this neighbor, never talked to him, which is on me, I've summarized in my head that this guy's a jerk. (laughs) And to be fully honest with what my heart was like, if, if he would come over to my house and say, hey, Matt, can I borrow your ladder? Or can I borrow a hammer? Or can I borrow a cup of sugar? I'm making cookies and I need sugar. My heart says, not a chance, jerk. Because we make up these excuses and reasons and we say, well, I don't want to do that to him. Uh, He doesn't deserve it. In fact, if, if I had to make a list of excuses, and you can do this too, I would come up with some of them like this. You got the good stuff, and we say things like this. Well, that person's not really my neighbor because they're not in my friend group, and so I don't feel like I need to help them. Or here's one, this'll hit a little closer. We do this one all the time. Um, I gave last time, so I don't need to give this time. We say that, right? I I gave once, I don't need to do it again. Here's another one. Um, They don't deserve the good stuff because they don't even have a job. 
or I've seen how they handle money, and so like, I don't want to give my money to them because they're going to mishandle it, or, or they don't really love Jesus, and so I'm not going to give it to them. Here's another one. We use this one all the time. I'm sure someone else will give the good stuff, and so I don't need to because they're going to do it. I mean, here's the reality, guys. We are all called to give the good stuff to others. That's what disciples do. It's part of being a disciple of Jesus where we put others first, you first, me second, and no matter the excuse, God's calling to all disciples is to give the good stuff freely and generously. And I, and I think if you could summarize this whole principle and message into two questions, it would be these two questions here on the screen for you. Who is my neighbor and what's the good stuff? Who is my neighbor and what's the good stuff? Who's my neighbor? Oftentimes, it's easy to excuse ourselves from serving somebody else because we say, they're outside of my group, they're outside of my network, they're, they're a little far away and so I don't need to do that. The problem is with this, you're shortchanging the person that needs the help and you're shortchanging yourself because you're not helping them. There's, there's a story in the Bible. It's a, a story about the Good Samaritan. An expert in the law, he comes to Jesus and he says, hey Jesus, what do I need to do to be saved? And Jesus summarizes the Ten Commandments in these two. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so the expert in the law, he comes back right back at Jesus and he says, well then who's my neighbor? And Jesus says, let me tell you a little story. And he tells the story of the Great Samaritan. This guy, he's traveling, maybe he's on a donkey, whatever it is. He gets beat up and bloody and bruised and, and he's robbed and they leave him in the gutter to die. And then people come by, several people come by and they pass by because they say, not this time, I got the good stuff, but not this guy because I can't touch him or I can't be around him or, or he's not good enough. Finally, a Samaritan comes by, picks the guy up, puts him on his donkey, takes him to a hotel, cleans his wounds, bandages him, gives him food, gives him water, pays for his hotel, pays for a longer stay at his hotel. And when Jesus finishes this story, he asks the expert in the law, he says, who was the neighbor in the story? And the expert says, the man who helped him. And so Jesus gives this point to you and me. He says, go and do likewise. Y'all, God's calling to Christians and disciples is to go to the whole world. It's every nation and kindred and tribe and tongue and race and gender and identity and political affiliation. It's everybody else. And it's for us to give the good stuff to somebody else. And as you think about who your neighbor is, let me help you with that. Your neighbor, your neighbors are those that live right around you and that live far from you. Your neighbor is those that are just like you and those that have nothing like you. Your neighbor are those that have a lot and have a little. Simply put, you can put it this way, your neighbor is anyone that is in need of something that you have. So what's the good stuff? Uh, we could make a list of uh, time and money and clothes and, and prayers and service. I mean, that's what Warehouse Community is doing today. They're giving the good stuff and they're serving. It's love, it's compassion, it's listening. I mean, the good stuff is living the gospel through kindness and love to the world that needs it more than anything else. I guess you could put it this way. Here's what the good stuff is. It's on the screen for you. The good stuff is anything that you have that somebody else needs. Your neighbor's anybody that needs your stuff, and the good stuff is anything that somebody else needs. It's, it's your opportunity to give what you have, what God's blessed you with, the good stuff, to give to somebody else. Today, I want to introduce you to some awesome people that you have maybe heard about, but you've never met. I want to introduce you to Rashad and Betsy Bell. In fact, you guys can come up at this time, and we can meet our church. Thanks, Vince. Ah, here they are. Hey guys, you've had a long morning. <laughs> this is Rashad and Betsy Bell. They are the founders, CEOs, I don't know what your titles are. Something like that. Something like that. They have founded Commis uh, Commission 127. It's a local nonprofit that's just down the street from us, not very far. I met them a couple of months ago, and we've emailed back and forth a few times, and I invited them here today to talk about what Commission 127 is, um, what your greatest need is and how we can help you. 
Awesome. Well, thank you. It's so nice to be here with all of you this morning. Um, we started Commission 127 about three years ago after um, walking along the foster adoption journey ourselves. So we have four little ones that are by our biological kiddos. And then our two oldest joined our family as teenagers um, and are now in their 20s, um, but they came from uh, foster care. And so we've walked along this journey. We were plugged into a church, and it was just hard for people around us to understand how to help, um, and we didn't really know how to ask for help. So we found this model that's now across the country and said this needs to be in Central Florida because churches all across Central Florida want to engage in this. It's very clear God says in James 1.27 to care for the orphans, but as a church body, it's sometimes hard to know. If you don't feel like that's your calling, you're like, well, that's somebody else's. <laughs> um, and yet there's this opportunity for everyone to find their place to care and give that good stuff. Um, and so that's what we do as Commission 127 is we help equip churches um, like yours to know how to have a family advocacy ministry to wrap around um, families who are called to do the hard work of loving kids from hard places through foster care or adoption. So we're super excited to walk alongside you guys. What we need most is, is you and your, whatever that looks like for you, if that's your, your time. Um, the model is really wrapping around six to 10 people, wrapping around one family and committing to serve them once a month. So it might be that you could bring a meal once per month and we get three other people to bring a meal once per month and now that family has a meal each week mm -hmm. and is feeling cared for and you're praying for them each week and there's somebody who's spending time with the kids once a month. So we're all super busy. So we hear messages like this sometimes and you're like, yes, my heart is that. But how do I do that with everything else that I've got on my plate? And so we're excited to walk alongside your church um, and Michelle, who will be out in the lobby to figure out how, how is it that you could care um, in, this, in this area? It's good. Um, I met uh, Betsy and Rashad at their headquarters, their, their offices. And um, I've told you before that Jesus just shines out of them. And I think you guys can see that as well. Now, Betsy and Rashad, you've already been through this in first service, so the surprise isn't really for you guys, but I'll just remind our church what we've been doing. Over the last four weeks, five weeks, we've been working on generosity, growing as disciples as we've put our money where our mouth is, and, and we've been uh, gathering funds. Now, I didn't know what the total was until just this last week, and uh, I was pretty excited about it. Would you like to see what the total is? All right, let me bring Michelle up here. This is Michelle Van Brussel. Um, we'll talk about you in just a minute. Now, you guys don't have to act surprised. I told them that they had to in first search, but that's we not You can fair. watch it online and watch our surprise. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So bring your face down so you can be expressed. There we go. That's good. Okay. On behalf of the Forest Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church and all the families that are here, we want to give this to you. Wow. I mean, it's still pretty incredible. <laughs> such an honor, such a blessing, and we are excited to partner with each and every one of you to make difference in kids from hard places, and you all have a part to all play in this. Actually, I used to always say everyone should either adopt or foster, then we adopted and fostered and quickly realized not all are called to adopt and foster. So <laughs> relax. But all of us are called to care. N now you guys are all caring. Thank you. Yes. Now, now here's what you've got to know and understand. First of all, it's actually more than 20. Um, I had to get the check made, so like more money has come in since then. So it's closer to 21,000, so that's wow. kind of a nice bonus. Um, but here's the other thing, in church, I'm talking to you right now. What's cool, and you guys too, what's cool about this number is that there's no big donors here. In fact, I asked um, Roland, who's our treasurer, I said, hey, tell me kind of how many people have, have given. And he said there's been almost 200 individual givers. That, that's families, that's individuals. Do you think that what that tells me is this? It tells me that the Forest Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church wants to grow as disciples. Isn't that cool? It also tells me this, 
it tells me that God is building momentum in this church to do something amazing and powerful right here in this local community. You guys are definitely part of that. Um, so thank you for taking this money because you're helping us. This is really for us, not for you guys. Please take our money. <laughs> uh, we know that you have lots of things that you can use money for, whether that's salaries or, uh, Rashad, we were talking about fundraising, different things. Maybe this is a start to some more fundraising for you guys. Before you guys go, I want to introduce you, and I know you've already met her, but this is Michelle Van Brussel. She's new to our church, and in fact, a few weeks ago, um, I made the appeal for someone that felt the burden to lead a family advocacy ministry with Commission 127, and Michelle jumped at it. In fact, she came the week before I even made the appeal. She's very excited about this, and so um, she's going to be talking with you. You'll be talking with her. In fact, um, Michelle, I'm going to let you get off this, the platform here soon so you can be out in the lobby. For those of you that want to be a part of Commission 127, the family advocacy advocacy ministry here in our church, just find Michelle in the lobby and she'll get your information and she can connect you with ways to, to reach the uh, first service. You said that how, you said a number of, yeah. Yes, here locally in Orange, Austin, and Seminole counties, we have over 1,800 children who are, yep. um, have been removed from their families um, and 148 children um, who actually aren't even in families because we don't have enough foster families here locally. So it's, it's, maybe it's not your calling, but as other people raise their hand to do this hard work, you can come alongside them and strengthen them and help them to, to do this better and longer. So awesome. thank you. Michelle, you can go out there. And guys, we love y'all. Thanks for taking our money. <laughs> <laughs> May we continue to be generous as we grow to be more and more you first disciples of Jesus.